Um, so I, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Carol, Dr. Carolina Johnson. Um, she is an experienced data-driven researcher with a background in R and Python and a long history of successfully designing and implementing research projects. She's earned degrees from Oxford, Harvard, and a PhD from the University of Washington. And she works as systems impact data scientist at King County. And she'll be talking to us today about a cloud migration project at King County, uh, and we'll be particularly focusing on data and analytics today. Uh, so Carolina, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so should I just jump right in? Yeah, uh, so why don't you go ahead with uh, kind of an overview of the project, and yeah. then, then we'll uh, talk about the details. Yeah, so I have been working at King County in our Department of Community and Human Services for um, just over five years. I hit my five-year anniversary two weeks ago. And while I've been here, I've gone through a couple of different um, iterations of my role. So I was originally hired to be a um, data analyst and evaluator in the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division, working on a couple of specific projects. And shortly after I was hired, I came in with all of my training in reproducible research and shifting to sort of scripted and centralized ways of doing things and pretty quickly got pulled into helping collaborate with our public health department and the King County IT department in really transforming the ways that our departments take responsibility for our data, take responsibility for building out our data pipelines and try to build some um, more shared infrastructure. So, and I was just gonna take maybe five minutes to give an overview about sort of what we've done over the past five years at a very high level. And then I know um, we're gonna have some structured Q and A to get a little more into the details. So historically, in my department, and as far as I know in the public health department in King County, but Public Health Seattle in King County is a huge organization that I've learned is very decentralized. There's all kinds of pockets of data practices that I'm unaware of there. Um, I've primarily been collaborating with folks who work in the um, unit called the Assessment Policy Development Evaluation um, Unit in Public Health. Um, so we historically had a lot of on-prem SQL servers. There was a little bit of playing with moving some things into AWS or not. Lots of things like Excel files being stored on shared local network drives. Lots of internal emailing of files with PII back and forth. And this is pretty common practice. You know, we'd, we'd be in, encrypting things and sending things securely, but there was a lot of ad hoc, one-off sharing, creating of data sets, saving of extracts, passing data back and forth. Um, we did not want to continue doing that for a variety of reasons and um, started working with KCIT to figure out how to scope and implement new data analytics platforms in the Azure cloud. This work coincided with and was um, primarily supported and often driven by a parallel push to be integrating at a client level, a number of our health and human services data sets. This was coming both from mandates from the county council who were wanting to see um, integrated reporting on service provision and sort of how funds were getting spent and a really growing understanding of the intersections and the, important of the importance of centering the human being, the individual who is interacting with multiple systems like our local jail systems, like our behavioral health care system, like our homeless um, response system. So there is both a sort of focus coming from council to be integrating data, a focus coming from our provider community and our own internal sort of program understanding of best practices to be integrating data at a client level and a desire to be streamlining and modernizing our data infrastructure. So what I'm going to talk about today um, is specifically what we call um, Huzzah, the Health and Human Services Analytic Workspace, which is actually sort of a, a, a single Azure database, Azure SQL database, but it's also then nested in a whole sort of scaffold of data infrastructure in the cloud. I'm gonna go ahead and just, do I have permission to share a screen? 
Um, Cause I, I do have one visual I'd love to just put up to sort of talk through what we built. Yep, okay, Kelly, I used to yep, have great. Share screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, okay, now I've, I've got it now, that's great. Okay, so I'm just, I'm not even gonna bother putting this in presentation mode cause it's just one slide. So what we've ended up building here is a, an infrastructure that basically allows us to blend data pipelines that are managed by our IT department. So where we have sort of production level transactional databases, like for example, our behavioral health and recovery divisions data system that handles all of the data submissions from providers then handles the communication to MCOs who are actually paying for all of this. Um, so there's a production level databases that IT needs to maintain control of and we cannot be um, letting analysts in with execute and create privileges, as well as the fact that as analysts in our Department of Community and Human Services and in our Department of Public Health, we are also creating and maintaining our own data pipelines of data specifically for analysis and evaluation. That can include data that we get from third parties um, through data sharing agreements or data that we create in our own internal systems. Um, in a variety of different ways. And so historically, there's been a tension between what is production level data that IT needs to lock down? What is data that is being built and maintained by analysts in departments? And how do we deal with the fact that analysts need to access and manipulate data in both spaces? The solution to this was basically, we moved into the Azure cloud. We built one series of pipelines that is primarily managed and maintained by our IT department, which allows us to basically mirror our production level databases by copying them into an Azure data lake, which then lives in an Azure data warehouse that can then can be accessed by analysts through this analytic workspace. The analysts themselves the data scientists and epidemiologists in our two departments can then build our own custom ETL, usually relying on um, connections through R, um, directly into the Azure SQL database, where we then have mirrors of production data that live right next to data that is being built and maintained um, at the department level rather than the IT level. The thing that also becomes very cool about this is it allows us to also build what we call our integrated data hub, which is basically just a um, more of just not quite a fully fledged master data management system, but it is basically an identity linkage backbone and some basic client level data reconciliation that again is maintained and managed by IT. It's a production level process. It runs every night and schedule jobs that our IT department has full control over the sort of ownership and maintenance of. But again, that linked identity data then can be made available to the appropriately credentialed users through um, links through basically external tables coming back into this analytic workspace. So it's been very interesting how for us moving to the cloud has really changed the way that we can both define responsibility over different parts of our data life cycle and our data process, and has given us a kind of modularity and a flexibility around who does what where, while still being able to connect the different pieces of our ecosystem in a way that's documented and transparent and um, will be able to evolve as our data systems and our expertise continue to change and grow. So I haven't gone into like a ton of detail about how this is set up or how we're dealing with permissions in this space. I know we have some questions coming up with that, but I thought this just for like a little bit of a high level overview of just a picture of the fact we're holding multiple pieces together and trying to allocate responsibility between different parts of our ETL and our data lifecycle um, to different types of roles within the King County organization has been really um, exciting and opened a lot of opportunities up for us. Great, thank you. That's uh, that's very helpful. That graphic's very helpful in kind of understanding how uh, how that whole thing came together. Um, and just so I'm understanding correctly, so it sounds like you took the data flows uh, that you said your IT was already managing. Um, you kind of moved that to the cloud, and then you created essentially a mirror of that for analysts to be able to go and and work off of without kind of bothering the existing flows and other processes that are happening. Is that correct? Um, that's partially correct. I would say 
one of the benefits of what we did and this is where I was like, this is not necessarily a talk so much about data infrastructure and cloud migration at the enterprise level as it is how the cloud has helped really support our data and analytics is in most cases, our existing production level databases that we were trying to improve the analyst sort of access and um, ability to build off of, those have all stayed in their um, existing locations. So we did not do a migration to Azure for our behavioral health database. That has continued to live where it is, which I believe it's actually in AWS right now. But again, I don't actually need to know that because what's happening is IT is building the data connections using Informatica. They connect to the sort of external production database. They're creating the mirror of that within Azure and maintaining that synchronous city which then can then get sort of a second level mirror into the space that the analysts are working so this azure data lake and the azure data warehouse that are here that is it kcit's own pipelines which are maintaining an accurate mirror of production systems which could be anywhere from an a different azure database it could be an aws database it could be an on-prem sql server so I think two of the different things we're bringing into Azure at this point are actually Microsoft dynamic systems. Um, so we're using, we're, we're actually using this, what we, we call it Huzzah, we pronounce it the health and human services analytics, analytic workspace Huzzah. Um, there was some pushback on that pronunciation from leadership, but eventually the users overruled them. We use Huzzah to actually get us the access to the back end of dynamic systems, which typically are very hard for analysts to do anything with. It's, it structures how you're meant to interact with the data. And that's been a very cool solution for us where we've been able to, like, we have a very significant system called Core, our client outcomes reporting engine, where we're able to use the dynamics platform for giving transparency into what's happening at the program and client level to program managers and the providers who submit data to that system. But then IT is able to set the connections up to pull the raw source data out of the Dynamics backend, land it in our Azure data lake, and then instantiate that into a database that our analysts can work with. So it's actually also let us find ways to compromise between the sort of production system that is targeting a non-expert, non-technical user, but also making the data available to the data scientists who can do more with it than what the analytics platform, the dynamics platform itself natively supports. So when I say like this framework, it's felt kind of like a hodgepodge of things as we improvised it together, but the actual platform we would built is proving to be um, very responsive to evolving business needs and data system needs because it basically separates whatever end user production data system we have from the analytic environment. And I, I think there's always, a, when you do a, an integration, there's always a kind of a natural tension. You have to draw that line somewhere between all the stuff that you're going to control sort of centrally and the things that are left for uh, for others to kind of keep managing themselves. So, um, so with, with the way it's been set up, uh, you do have those integrations that are sort of built out for, uh, for some of those other data sets. Um, and you then end up with a kind of a, a, a one master, well, I guess you call it the master client information, um, the integrated data hub, where there is kind of an overall picture, uh, of, of everything, even though your IT doesn't have to manage down to uh, down to the ground on everything, and uh, I guess that actually that brings up a, a question I'd been thinking about with with um, reproducibility uh, for some of the studies that are done. Um, people will want to have essentially a snapshot in time uh, of the data that they used for a particular study. Um, so it sounds like with this setup, uh, they would the analysts would be able to just sort of create that using their own data if if that's what they started with. Um, so you don't have to worry about managing all of that in the system. They would still have the ability to do that uh, kind of on their own. Is that accurate? Yes. So just another architecture piece for this um, analytic workspace. So we're looking at this database here. I'm going to pop us to a different visual of the same structure. This is the visual I would show to people who actually like, wait, how are all these different pieces connecting between the departments and IT? This is actually what we would show 
the analysts who are working in the department is suddenly we zoom in on Huzzah on the analytic workspace. So the analytic workspace is um, one of the challenges of doing this work and with data sharing and data integration is always that tension between, well, we don't wanna give everyone access to everything, um, but the more you can have things in the same place, the more you open up opportunities to have efficiency, reproducibility, get stuff done. And so our analytic workspace, each contributing data system, whether it's a integrate, uh, whether it's a data pipeline that KCIT manages for one of the big production level data systems, or if it's more of an analysis and evaluation data set, like for example, we get Medicaid claims data from the state that's managed by our public health department. These come into this database, but everything lives in strictly segregated schema and the schema our access at an analyst level is controlled at the schema level. And so you only have access to say the HMIS data in this data system if you are a user who has completed whatever is required to have access to HMIS. We have a monthly membership audit process. This is all governed with Azure Active Directory groups. And what's been cool about that is it means we have all of the data lives in Azure in a space we can access it side by side and we can connect data systems, but we're able to control access to each system at a granular level in a way that's very transparent and the requirements are then made very clear. Um, so that that for us was one of the, the big compromises is how do you bring data into one space while maintaining segregation? We've done that using schema in a single database and mapping those schema very specifically to roles based off of Active Directory group membership that is audited and controlled. Um, so we, if an analyst is working, say, with behavioral health data and they've done an evaluation and they need a snapshot, they can create that snapshot. They can save that snapshot as a table within this database um, and save it to the schema where only people who would already have access to that data can see it. So it it's like it, cre it makes all the data we have more visible in the sense that it's transparent that we have data in this space. But what it does is it removes the temptation or the necessity for people to be saving data extracts and say putting them in a secure file location, which uh, we can't even do that under some of our data sharing agreements. Like we have to keep all of our data in a place where data is encrypted at rest. So this is a space that gives us data that's encrypted at rest. It gives people a place that's transparent and known where all data should be stored. And we can say very clearly, you should never save an identified extract of data out of the system. And we can set those rules in place. Um, so it makes everything more visible. And that can make people more nervous at first when you think about how you bring people on board to bringing data up in the space. You're like, but now like all of our data is up in the cloud and anyone could get it. I was like, well, anyone could have gotten data access to our data by requesting access to that on-premise database too. And what was going to happen is they were going to then save an extract of that data locally to use for something else. So we've put everything in the cloud to give us that modularity and that transparency. And it's allowed us to cut down the other ways that we use, store, and manipulate data which has been really powerful. So we say identified data should only be stored here. You use SQL and you use R to work with that data, but you do not save out extracts from this database. And it's giving us a um, better data discipline internally. And and that is something that, uh, that can lead to a little bit of friction uh, as people kind of change the way they do the work. Um, I know I've been through that process uh, myself and, and it, it takes a little getting used to. Um, and also I'll, I'll mention uh, to everyone, please feel free to uh, put questions in the chat and we will be uh, trying to get to those and uh, we'll have a, a live Q and A session uh, in a little bit as well. Um, but uh, but do go ahead and, and put questions in the chat. So just to kind of wrap up on this topic, the, uh, the data governance is, is a huge issue and I think a pain point for uh, folks that are looking at potentially uh, embark on this process. Uh, and in this example, you really have dealt with a large number of different kind of data governance models and approaches and requirements um, just from many different sources and managed to bring that all together. So you had to go through that process of identifying all that, bringing it all together, setting up all of this access. But having done that, um, you now have much better control and visibility over what's happening. And as, as you are just describing, you can stop that uh, kind of data leakage uh, outside of secure encrypted uh, systems. And 
I, I mean, I think that's just a really significant point, uh, especially these days with a lot of concern about uh, data security. Um, but so, so to people who are are looking at this task um, and and finding it a bit daunting, uh, you know, what what advice would you give, or what what would you say to them as as encouragement? Um, well, that that it is daunting. So it's it's going to take longer than you think it should. Um, I think the thing that's been the most significant for us in King County has actually been focusing on relationship building and trust building. Um, data governance work is about bringing people together, understanding what concerns are, understanding both what the emotional concerns are and what the legal concerns are, and figuring out how to set systems in place to increase trust and reliability that no one's going to be doing anything that you don't know about with your data. Um, and a lot of that has been, you know, we figured out what data was there. We set the legal frameworks in place to be able to bring the data into the cloud. Um, but we have a monthly data, data stewardship meeting that is centered around particularly the um, data linkage piece of it and the sort of access to shared um, data that comes as a result of the data linkage. But that has given us a platform for a monthly meeting where we have data stewards from across our different departments, including our privacy and compliance officers and folks from our um, IT's um, privacy and security folks. That just every month we check in, we actually talk about what's happening in terms of development in the system, what are our shared needs, whenever we bring in a new a new data system into the actual identity linkage piece, which I've not been making, um, talking about in detail in this, but I'm happy to type questions on that in the Q&A. Um, anytime we've established policies and procedures for any time anyone is combining data or asking questions about data that is owned by someone outside of their own unit, we have policies for review and communication on that. And we just were very transparent between our two departments now in a way that we didn't have a venue for that level of communication and transparency. And yeah, the, the data governance, there's, there's the legal elements of it, but there is also just building and maintaining the trust and the relationships and approaching your data partners and your data sharing partners in sort of good faith and a question of like, what do we need to do in order to trust each other um, to see and not even necessarily to see the data, but just to even know that your data exists. Cause there's that sort of sense that people often wanna close down. They don't even want anyone to know that they have data because if you let someone know you have it, they might ask for it. And just trying to figure out how do we start to change that culture of defensiveness to just being a, like a little bit more open being like, okay, we can see that you we can see that you have data, but we're not even going to be able to see that data. But maybe eventually, now that it's here, when there's something that's in both of our best interests, we can then talk about what do we need to have in place to make a particular use of that data safe. So it's just both creating the infrastructure which allows collaboration to happen, um, but then yeah, just having that pol those policies and procedures in place and just continuing to do the work and continuing to have the conversation. So this wasn't something we set up once and it's done and it's not going to change again. It's we set it up and at the same time we set up new platforms and, you know, and no one likes more meetings, but we set up new meetings where we just put people in the same room and just check in as a routine, not just when something goes wrong, but just on an ongoing basis every month. How's it going? What are you working on? How's it going? What are you working on? That makes sense. And um, I think that leads into a, a couple of questions that have come up in, in the chat. Um, as you put all of these different data sources together, uh, do they all have to conform to an enterprise data standard? Sort of a, a question about how you actually do that, uh, that integration. And then I think related to that, uh, what new tools did you have to learn uh, in order to to deal with all of this? Um, do how much do the individual analysts need to learn about this system, and what tools do they need to learn? Um, so, if you can kind of go into some of those details. Yeah. So I'll take that first question about enterprise data standards first. So one of the this may or may not be what you want to hear, but one of the things that that modularity of our system 
has made it work better for us is that we have not enforced any data standards. What's happened is we have allowed people to take their existing data and their existing data structures and put it into a shared place. This does mean this is not a sort of free for all where we've integrated client level data in a way that's accessible to everyone or accessible to people who would not already be having access to this data. That was too big of a thing to bite off. We'd actually initially worked with our IT department as part of the identity linkage to talk about, could we build a cross-system data model that's actually capturing service engagement and event data at the person level in a way that's standardized and integrated? That was not sustainable. I'm just gonna be very honest with this group. The complexity and the um, dynamic nature of the contributing data that's going into the system was such that maintaining stand data standards and sort of alignment transformation across those systems was not sustainable. So I'm just going to be very blunt about that. We did not do that. What we And that was actually part of the motivation for figuring out that more flexible and more modular approach was originally there was an idea, IT is just going to ingest all of the data from all these different systems and then create a nicely populated data model. Then they found out how much the data changes and how many data quality issues there are. And the fact that historical data can be updated. If you're dealing with you know claims and medical information, that stuff updates as providers update. So our IT department came to understand the complexity of our data in a way they had not previously understood. And we were able to, again, shift that responsibility to be like, there is a huge amount of expertise in these data systems that exists in the business departments that do the work. The challenge is how do we put that data in a place that they can work with it and leverage their expertise? So one of the things that's come out of it is that we are now able to start building in a sort of domain specific way that's driven by the business rather than IT requirements, some of those common data standards and some of those common, I'm actually working on a project right now where I am going to a bunch of our analysts and our users and being like, there are some common concepts about our clients that we keep coming back to that we do not have data standards for. Help me define that data standard and I will help build the data pipeline to populate a table that is held at the sort of data expert and data manager level rather than trying to be set at an enterprise level and managed by IT. So it's it's right now the way the solution worked that's been very cool is that it has not required us to fix these extremely deep, you know, extending all the way through the data life cycle issues with data quality and data ingestion where we have some data that's 30 years old and dealing with that data quality versus a system we've just built out in the past two years it's really different but it's saying like this this azure architecture has met us where we are with our data maturity and is allowing us to keep improving our data quality and replace things as they get better um, so that's like from just like d data standards We've been able to take in basically data in any shape and form and dump it into our data lake and then figure out what to do with it from, from there. So and we're not and forcing anything back on people. Yeah, And that's really encouraging. I mean, I, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, you don't have to solve all of those problems all at once. You, you just take that initial step. And then as use cases come up driven by business need, uh, driven by domain experts, then you can figure out what's needed to to accomplish those goals uh, as as they happen. So I, I I mean I think that's really encouraging. It says you don't you don't have to do that huge daunting problem. Um, and then and then the the second part of that question was the the tools. Yeah. So there has been some, um, especially for some of the staff who've been around longer, there have been some transitions um, in place in terms of in terms of tools like there are some folks who you know we're wanting to keep working with excel and spss as analysts who may have been been around for a while and you know this this stuff just shows up as a sql database right where uh, the way we've designed it what analysts interact with is at the end of it a sql database and as long as they know how to write some sql or know how to write R that's going to get translated into SQL, they can interact with it. The bigger shock has been for the teams that have, did not historically necessarily have data that was being stored in SQL databases. Um, 
they have had to get over sort of some initial learning SQL issues. Um, we've been on a kick to be standardizing and modernizing how our teams work to be bringing them to using a shared tool set of using SQL R and Tableau as the primary tools for all of the business, all of the data analysis and business work we do. We're trying to get away from lots of different projects using lots of different tool sets and then you can't get people to backfill. And so we were trying to, so there was, a, at the same time we were doing this push to the cloud with our data infrastructure, we were also trying to get better alignment within our team on shared tools and practices. So there was a sort of combination of the two that has worked quite well for just people had to change some of their workflows, but they had, but we were already planning to support them in changing their workflows. I think the, one of the bigger things is just really normalizing that people cannot save extracts of data. Like, I think that's just an honest, like when people want to work with things, there is sort of a comfort of knowing that you've saved the CSV file and you're just going to load that same CSV file next time you work with things. That's not good practice with data. And so we didn't want people doing that anyway. We wanted things to be being scripted raw from the raw data and then sort of constructed um, and documented through code. Again, moving everything to ZA and putting clear policies in place over where data could and should be stored and really limiting people to keeping their data in this cloud database, you know, has forced people to change some of the ways they think about and work with sort of project specific data pipelines. Um, but again, that's been changed in ways that we wanted to change anyway. So changing the infrastructure at the same time as we were hoping to um, centralize some of the tool sets people were using. They just they just work together. And there hasn't been resistance from the team. There's just been making sure that we have the time and support in place. So it's like we have a documentation center we've been building out that has a ton of best practices and example code for how to set things up, how to connect things. We have, in my department, we have monthly what we call our data group um, meetings, but they're basically just technical, informal peer training sessions. So people who have more experience and things like, how do I connect to Azure in this way? Or how do I, when we've been shifting everyone to using um, GitHub and using version control for all of our projects too. So it's, we just really focused on skill development and technical support as a priority for us internally anyway. So the migration to the cloud has just been integrated with our existing sort of focus on supporting our teams to continue building their skills and sort of come to some shared practices. So it it, it sounds like it wasn't a matter of of having to learn a, a lot of kind of brand new tools, but mm -hmm. uh, but maybe coming up to speed with SQL uh, queries and and things like that, um, and we and kind of dropping some of the older tools that yeah. uh, that weren't really available with this framework? We're not using a lot of, um, you know, there's a ton of other kinds of analysis environments and spaces to work, you know, if you're up in Azure, because we're these shops that are based in business departments and not in our IT department, we have certain constraints in what and how we can do certain things. And I think for us, the bigger pushes, it's like we wanted to meet people as close to where they were with the tools and ways of working. So if we did not need to bring something into sort of a cloud-based machine learning environment, if we didn't need to. So it was like the fact that you can connect to this database and it's just a database, you can still just make um, an ODBC connection and work in R and work in whatever you're used to working in through ODBC. It really was a minimal disruption in that sense. We did not force everyone to move to the cloud for everything. We said, we're moving our data to the cloud. We're keeping our analysis practices and our skills wherever we already had the best convergence of our staff. And we did not force them to migrate their workflows to the cloud. We just forced them to migrate their connections to the cloud. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so turning in a little bit different direction here, um, and using a few more of the questions from the chat actually. Uh, so one question was who leads your data governance committee? So uh, if if a group is is trying to move in this direction, they know they need to do this, this data governance work. 
um, who, how, how do you organize that? And, and kind of related to that, um, as you, as you start, you, you talked a little bit earlier about, uh, kind of the reasons why, why this project was started, um, directives from council directives around, uh, trying to secure the data and so on. Um, so, so the, the other question from Chad is what was the, uh, the winning argument that helped bring that stakeholder engagement, uh, to, to centralize this, um, so, so how kind of what do you see as successful in terms of uh, getting stakeholder buy-in uh, and and organizing uh, that data governance? And I mean, you've talked a lot about how you have a structure now where you can have those conversations and and make sure everyone is uh, is comfortable with what's happening with their data. But but how do you get it started? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of who leads the data governance committee, that's actually me. I'm the facilitator who makes that meeting happen every month. Um, uh, staffing this kind of thing is really hard. Um, that's just calling out if staffing data governance is challenging. So I sort of just ended up falling into this role because for a variety of things that are not worth taking time to talk about. Um, but I am the person who makes sure that meeting happens every month. Um, but if I stop doing it, we would have people in place to give it to. The way, this, the sort of way this evolved, we had the benefit that the this is not a full countywide enterprise platform. We are not trying to do data governance for the entire county and all of the county's data assets. We are really laser focused on the health and human services space that our public health and um, community human, department of community and human services folks work with. So we as stakeholders already had, you know, some ways we were and were not aligned, but a sort of shared interest and an understanding of the importance of being able to look at our clients from a systemic point of view. That was just a goal that people in both of our departments already had. So we didn't have to do a ton of persuading, at least at the core group. In terms of how we built this out, I think one thing that was really significant is we started small. We did not start with every single data system or every single data source that we touch in our departments. We started with sort of what we saw as our three go first major data systems, which were our Medicaid claims that we have um, through DSA with the state. Um, but we our public health department relies very heavily on Medicaid claims for a ton of pretty much all of our population health surveillance work. We have our behavioral health and recovery division data, um, which is a huge data system that we built and maintain internally, and our HMIS system. Those three, the stakeholders for those three systems, because behavioral health, physical health, and housing and homelessness are such just understood to be such intertwined challenges, understanding that we needed to integrate that data or bring that data into alignment was not hard because analysts in these departments were already doing these linkages on an ad hoc one-off basis and that's not sustainable so the motivation to bring those together was natural from the stakeholders point of view because it was formalizing work that was already happening in inefficient ways once we got those three sources integrated and we started to build out the infrastructure, we could demonstrate A, we have a meeting structure, A, we have a, B, we have a way of collaborating, and C, we actually have an environment in the cloud that is making certain things easier for us. And once we could demonstrate that sort of proof of concept, like look how we are A, able to protect the data, and B, how our lives are getting easier because our data is here rather than somewhere else. Um, we then started having people be like, hey, can we join you? So we have sort of two different types of sort of governance management. One is just for data that's coming into that cloud database space. And one, a, a, a more in-depth level of governance happens around data that's actually getting linked because the linkage, the blending of PII is a more complicated um, point of view from governance. But once we had built that Azure platform, the benefits of being able to get your data there and being able to start improving for all of the reasons we ever talked about, we've had other people asking to have, can we have our data up in Huzzah? Can we bring our, can we make a schema and put our data in Huzzah? 
So there was definitely a snowball of once we sort of did the proof of concept and said, we can do this and we can govern it and we can show you how this is safe and functional. Um, for the most part, the challenge is sort of figuring, just figuring out the responsibility and the logistics around that. That's not universally been the case. And there, there've definitely been some spaces where there's been a lot more back and forth in conversations just to, again, provide reassurance of like the data is secure in this space for these reasons. You can have control over the data or you can have work with IT to set up a pipeline. So just some, some places are more complex and require more conversations. But I'd say once we start, once we started to build it, additional partners just started to come because the utility became pretty clear. Well, it's always a great sign when, uh, when you get the snowball rolling and everybody starts joining in and, and wanting to be part of it. Um, so, uh, so kind of going, well, continuing, I guess, on, on uh, data governance, um, when there are requirements for forgetting, for, for deleting things, mm -hmm. um, could you talk about uh, a little bit about the complexity of that and how that mm -hmm. uh, is handled and affects things? Yeah, so this is again where the modularity of the architecture is really handy. Our decision is that basically the source system um, that's feeding into the cloud is the source of rec is sort of the database of record, and whatever's in the cloud should match that. So we've basically pushed the requirements for forgetting back to the original data source. So, I mean, we just completed this with. Um, a purge of historical data from our Medicaid claims um, extract that we get from the state. Or I don't know if there's anyone here who would care or be relevant about that. But that data, the ETL for that data, which does have very explicit requirements for forgetting in place, um, the initial ETL that constructs the set of records, which are the records that are included, is handled sort of externally to how it's then fed into the linkage and the um, the cloud, the workspace that's there. And so we do rely on our contributing systems to forget data when they need to forget it. Um, but once they've forgotten it, um, it should, it'll be excluded through the mirroring process. Um, so it's like our forgetting is as good as a contributing system. Forgetting has not been made worse because we moved to the cloud. Um, <laughs> so- That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it is more complicated when you think about, you know, the data linkage piece, because then, you, then you're actually blending data. But we do have processes in place that basically now are going back and using that source system as the source of truth and saying, if a record is no longer in the source of truth, it and all of its dependencies then get removed from the identity linkage pipeline too. So, so looking at the opposite end of the spectrum on that, uh, for data that is is public and that that you want to make more public. Um, many, uh, I've seen many government agencies try to take steps to get their data online and you know, open up an API for access and that sort of thing. Um, is that something that's sort of explicitly considered in, in this framework? This framework is explicitly not for any public use. You can't right. connect even a public Tableau dashboard a public facing Tableau dashboard to this database because of the sensitivity of the data that's here. It's I'm not, I am not the person to get into the network security configuration that you'd want to be speaking with folks from IT, but you cannot see this data from outside the King County network. You don't even know it exists. So that is something that at, from an sort of analyst and the user's point of view, we have been talking about, you know, what would it look like as we sort of begin to bring data together to try to think about how to make some of the insights from that data more accessible to the public? Um, but that would be a, a very different endeavor that would be worthwhile. But this, is, this system we've built is very much an internal, highly sensitive system for credentialed internal users only. Okay. Well, that, that certainly makes sense. Um, there, uh, there is a question from the chat about uh, the the data linkage process. Is is that? I don't know how far down in the weeds we can get, but uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, 
the data linkage process is handled um, on an ongoing basis by our KCIT data services team. They use Informatica data quality to do the linkage. So we have data systems, a couple of the contributing systems to our identity linkage process are sort of live transactional data systems. We do a nightly snapshot of those systems as part of the data warehouse pipeline. So we do do a nightly refresh of the identity linkage, bringing in any new identities that have appeared that day. Um, for a couple of systems, that is, you know, a daily update for several of other systems, those update on a monthly or bi-weekly cadence. And yeah, it's, I, I'm not in control of that linkage. It's all Informatica and our data services team, but it's a blend of probabilistic and deterministic algorithms. So we do use Informatica's proprietary probabilistic models um, sort of on one path of links. And then we have a series of additional deterministic rules that we use to force or break links within that. It's an ongoing process. We'd sort of do ongoing QA. We are continuing to integrate new sources into that as we get sort of interest from those um, partners and funding for it. So it's sort of every time we go through a new linkage, there's a really in-depth QA process that our analysts um, in public health and DCHS are involved in to sort of vet the quality of the linkage. The linkage itself, once it's set up and going, we are sort of treating as our best compromise in a sense. So we know that there's, you know, trade-offs between false negatives and false positives in the system. Um, we've tended to err on the side of preferring false negatives to false positives because we do use this data in ways that we would rather miss a link than be connecting people across systems erroneously. But so yeah, it's it's an ongoing, sort of always a work in progress, always in development. But um, I'm happy to um, follow up one on one with someone who's sort of more curious technically about how we implemented that I can share more details. But um, it sort of goes deep in the weeds very quickly if I start to go into any more detail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Time has flown by here, uh, and uh, this has really been amazing uh, participation by the audience. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for all the questions in the chat. Um, I did want to uh, offer if there's anything we missed, um, if anyone would like to uh, act, actually ask a question live, um, you can uh, raise your hand, and uh, and we'll let you do that. Uh, or if there are are any last questions that uh, anyone wants to post in the chat. Um, we're we're actually at the point of uh, of needing to wrap up soon. Um, so uh, and and Carolina, I wanted to give you a, a chance to um, kind of have any any closing thoughts, anything that's uh, that's come up after this uh, this conversation. Anything you want to share? Um, I did see one more question pop up in the chat mm -hmm. um, about de-identification and small number suppression, mm -hmm. and. We are not doing any de-identification or small number suppression within this system because this really is just, it's a platform to um, structure how we access our raw data and work with our raw data effectively. We do have policies around de-identification, small number suppression for anything that we create, especially anything that gets, um, that relies on our identity linkage piece, there is then a, actually a, a strict set of review and we don't distribute any line level data from the system at the moment. So not even de-identified line level data. We would only be um, sharing out aggregate data with small number suppression. Okay. Um, oh, and I do see a hand, uh, Christopher Moore. Yeah, thanks. I, I really appreciate this. It's been really helpful. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there. I did, I have a question and you know, if it, too, too detailed or you didn't want to get into it. I was just curious why you wanted to keep, uh, I'll, I'll call it the transactional database or the, the, the database of truth out of uh, of this environment and in, it's sort of like an AWS, but it could have just been, you know, on-prem or, or anything like that. Is there a particular reason that choice happened? Um, because that is a huge 30-year-old data system that was actually in the process of being scoped for replacement. Um, it's that, that is just, a beast of a data system that mm -hmm. is the backbone of King County's entire behavioral health, publicly funded behavioral health system. And anything that involves a change to that system itself is a, a huge operation in its own right. So like part of keeping small, things yeah. out is just 
being like, we need to build a space for analytics that we can make things work better. And that involves not redesigning every major data system that we work with along the way. I appreciate that. If I could sneak in another one related to the analytical workspace, you know, obviously it sounds like it's controlled uh, using uh, Azure AD and those database schemas that you talked about and having, you know, the ability to to kind of access those on a, you know, program level or, or unit level basis. It almost sounded like, you know, you were able to allow folks to create database objects within that or maybe manipulate data within that. Um, you know, I'm just curious, as, as that's happening, um, you know, do you have an issue with the, the, the mirror replication that's going on there you know, from that source database? And then I'm going to combine it a little bit. If people are creating new content within that, I didn't see a mechanism of getting that out. Um, is that an issue? Do they end up not doing anything within that environment? They, they create it and then somehow they get it into a meaningful place beyond that? Uh, so if people are creating objects, they just live in the analytic workspace. They don't move back into the production database. So there, there's, there's, there's a one-way valve system there. Things that are being mirrored from the production databases are coming in as external tables. And so they show up, they live in their own space. We don't create or modify external tables back to the data warehouse, except in some very specific exceptional circumstances. Um, things that are created within Huzzah are considered sort of the responsibility of the teams who own that schema in a sense. So we have platforms for data doc for documentation of all objects that are being created, which includes specifying the source code of anything you've created and who the maintainer is. There is an expectation that we will eventually set up um, policies for just purging um, objects that are no longer being maintained. But for the most part, the structure of the data has enough sort of contiguity with the structure of the teams and the business questions and areas where we work that we just we just self-manage sort of within each schema. There is a primary team that owns it and um, we have some shared um, practices and documentation around how to do that. Um, every person, one thing I didn't actually call out is every user of the system does have a personal schema, which only they have access to where they have full read and um, execute privileges. Not everyone has the ability to create in every schema they have access to. Those We do have sort of developer and just reader permissions differentiated. So when people are just creating ad hoc things on an ad as needed basis for themselves, that lives in their personal schema. And if someone then separates from the organization, we just delete their schema and whatever's in it as well. So we do try to minimize clutter culturally and practically. Okay. Uh any any last questions? I'm not seeing any more show up. I, I wanted to have just one last question, which is uh, having gone through this process, can you give just a, a quick example of something that uh, is is doable now that was not something that could be done before? I mean, anything could have been done before, just with like a lot of grief. Um, I think I can say DCHS is shortly about to launch publicly. I don't know when, so don't quote me on this, but I know we're very close to launching it. Our DCHS dashboard, which is reporting at a deduplicated sort of department system level way, our impact, our services and impact in the community. And that work of blending data from all of those different data systems, creating the tables and cr creating a dashboard that relies on that integration was a lot easier having moved to the cloud. So we are being much, it's much more sustainable and we have pipe processes in place where you can now refresh that dashboard on an annual basis um, in a way that provide presenting that consolidated view of our services. Um, it's not easy now, but it is much more accessible and much more sustainable um, with the platforms that we built. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your wisdom on this, and uh, I I think it's been very helpful for for folks who are are working on this or considering uh, a project like this, um, and just getting that kind of practical view uh, from someone who's gone through it and uh, and seen all the complexities and dealt with them successfully. Um, Really appreciate uh, you being here, Carolina. Uh, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for, uh, for joining in and listening. 
And uh, I think I will hand it back over to Jagadesh uh, to sign us off. Excellent, thank you. Uh, that was an excellent discussion. Thanks, Dr. Derek Stanford, and uh, thanks, Dr. Carolina. I just want to kind of uh, point out uh, specific um, URLs. So uh, the monthly events are already scheduled, so you could get the more details about the monthly event on the website. And of course, we also welcome people who want to be involved in the user group. So please feel free to submit and uh, through our contact us um, link. And if you like to hear more about a specific case study, uh, you would have an opportunity to nominate a case study as well. So feel free to do that from our website and uh, we'll do our best to bring in speakers uh, might be talking about a similar case study, like just what we just went through. And uh, we wanna make sure we get the feedback from you and uh, kind of tune our further user group events. And of course, we wanna keep the conversation uh, in our LinkedIn page. So feel free to join the LinkedIn group and uh, feel free to post additional questions. I know there are some questions which came up and we couldn't take it up. So we'll kind of address that in our LinkedIn group. Uh, and thanks again for joining. You will be included in the mailing list for further events and uh, feel free to kind of join uh, as, as the time permits. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate everyone joining this session.